This is everything that you need to know about thermal paste when building a PC. We'll start with the beginner basics, but stick around to uncover the secret thermal paste techniques and optimizations that even PC building experts don't often talk about. But first off, what is thermal paste and why is it so important? Well, simply put, thermal paste is a goo that helps keep your computer cool. By itself, it doesn't actively do much of anything, but when squished between a CPU and a cooler, thermal paste does a fantastic job of pulling heat away from the core parts of your PC. You know how sound travels faster underwater than in plain air? Well, heat behaves kind of similarly inside of your computer. With just a pocket of air between your CPU and cooler, even if it's microscopic, that air takes a long time to move heat from one to the other and is fairly inefficient. So when we replace that air pocket with thermal paste instead, Instead, the heat from the CPU is now moved much quicker from the processor to the cooler, allowing the CPU to remain at much lower temperatures. So ultimately, you can think of thermal paste as a highway for heat in between your CPU and cooler. Now how do you apply thermal paste? For first-time PC builders, I always recommend a P-size dot or an X marks the spot thermal paste pattern on your CPU prior to installing your CPU cooler. Assuming, of course, that your CPU cooler doesn't have thermal paste pre-applied onto it. If it does, you should be good to go. Otherwise, these two patterns are a great rule of thumb and will get the job done. But for you experts out there, stick around to learn why thermal paste patterns don't actually matter. But in the meantime, a dot or an X will do just fine. Now, if you're nervous about applying thermal paste for the first time, just know that if you happen to use too much thermal paste and a little bit spills over onto the motherboard, it's very unlikely to cause any damages to your PC. While thermal paste does a great job at conducting heat, it usually does a very poor job at conducting electricity, which is great. Unless, of course, you're using liquid metal thermal paste, which I'll talk about in a little bit. I know it can feel scary to apply thermal paste for the first time, but don't worry, you're going to do great. And remember that using too much thermal paste is is better than using none at all. And to help build your confidence even further, you can pick up a thermal paste practice tool like this one, which I designed specifically to help give you a visual sense of how much thermal paste you should be using. These things are actually really cool for first-time PC builders, and you can check them out at yeasterpaste.com. Okay, so now the thermal paste is applied into your computer, but now how often should you be replacing it? Now, regardless of anything else, the one time you should always be replacing your thermal paste is if you ever remove your CPU cooler off of your CPU. Doing so will completely disrupt your existing thermal paste and just trying to squish it back on can lead to a bunch of air pockets which you definitely don't want to have. But aside from that edge case, most thermal paste manufacturers recommend reapplying your CPU's thermal paste once every couple years, but in reality, your thermal paste can last a whole lot longer than that. For you more advanced users out there, I'll talk about how to actually determine when you need to reapply thermal paste in a little bit, but for a beginner rule of thumb, you can think about replacing your thermal paste every two years. And to do so, you can simply remove your CPU cooler, take a paper towel to wipe off any excess thermal paste, and for any residue that's hard to get off, you can use some isopropyl alcohol, which will not damage your computer at all. And then, once your CPU and CPU cooler are both clean and dry, you can reapply your P-size dot or X pattern and then just reinstall your cooler. And just like that, your thermal paste is good for another couple years. But now you might be wondering, is thermal paste safe? I accidentally got a little bit of it on my finger when installing that previous step. And don't panic, it'll all be okay. You can simply wash it off with some soap or I've actually found that laundry detergent works really well at getting it off, but then you can carry on with your happy life and not worry about it. That said, because thermal paste is made up of a variety of chemicals, the safest thing to do is always to just avoid any type of skin contact and especially consumption of it altogether. But if you happen to be extremely curious of what happens if someone did happen to eat thermal paste, you can check out this video where I do just that. Okay, what should I do with my thermal paste tube after I'm done using it? Once you've finished applying thermal paste onto your CPU, you can safely dispose of your empty tube into your garbage as normal. But personally, I think uh, proudly displaying the tube as part of your PC setup is the way to go. You can even document when you apply the thermal paste so that you roughly know when you need to reapply it in the future, or at least have record of when you applied it. And to help with that, I did design these little thermal paste magnetic holsters to fit the average thermal paste tube. Look at just on the PC, how cool is that? But okay, onto the more advanced thermal paste stuff. What is thermal paste actually made of? We mentioned thermal paste having various chemicals inside of them, but specifically, a typical thermal paste consists of a base and a filler. Most thermal pastes use a silicone base mixed together with a thermally conductive microparticle filler such as aluminum, copper, or silver. These filler particles are a decent indicator of how well that thermal paste will transfer heat, as the thermal conductivity of these materials directly impacts its ability to do so. Watts per meter Kelvin is the measurement of thermal conductivity, and typically the higher that number, the better. But 
thermal conductivity is only one property of many when it comes to comparing thermal pastes. So that leads us to our next question. How exactly should we be comparing different thermal pastes? Well, thermal pastes have a variety of unique properties, including thermal conductivity, thermal resistance, specific gravity, viscosity, operating temperature, and color. Here's a quick breakdown of what all of those mean and what it means for cooling your PC. As I mentioned, thermal conductivity is a material property of the paste that directly affects how efficiently heat moves throughout the paste. The higher number here indicates better heat transfer. Now, thermal resistance, on the other hand, might sound similar, but actually depends on how much paste is used, like the thickness of the paste, and is inversely related to thermal conductivity. So lower resistance values means that less heat is trapped within the paste, and so lower numbers here are better. Specific gravity is a measure of density relative to water, with higher values usually meaning better performance and longevity. Viscosity is how well the paste flows and affects the ease of application by determining how well the paste can fill all of those microscopic air pockets in between the CPU and cooler. Lower viscosity typically means that the paste will spread easily, but may translate to not holding up as well over time. Now, operating temperature range is fairly self-explanatory. It is just the temperatures in which the thermal paste is guaranteed to work, and you really shouldn't have to worry about this at all unless you're doing something super intense like using dry ice or liquid nitrogen to cool your computer. In those cases, you'll need to ensure that your thermal paste is specifically designed to work in super cold temperatures. And finally, the last property, color. Thermal paste does come in a variety of colors, typically without affecting its thermal performance. Easter paste, for example, is jet black, whereas I've also come across blue or even pink pastes as well. This one is purely an aesthetic choice that you really won't ever see because the thermal paste is squished between your CPU and cooler. <laughs> so when you're comparing or shopping around for thermal paste, consider ones with high thermal conductivity, low thermal resistance, and a medium viscosity. If you're just comparing these raw properties, you might think that this thermal paste is a clear choice to put on a CPU. However, liquid metal thermal paste has a dangerous trade-off of it being electrically conductive, meaning that even if a single drop of it lands on your motherboard while your PC is running, there's a good chance for a short-circuit disaster. These liquid metal thermal pastes are typically not meant to be used on top of your CPU in your basic PC, so it's best to avoid them altogether. A better place for the liquid metal thermal paste is actually inside your CPU, underneath the IHS where it can't escape and flow onto any other components. But like I said, liquid metal thermal paste is a bit more advanced and not something that you as a new PC builder should keep in mind. And stick with a silicone or ceramic one instead. Alternatively, you can always compare different thermal pastes by looking up performance videos on YouTube which will give you a sense of how these properties impact real world performance. And speaking of being inside a CPU, let's talk about some lesser known thermal paste industry secrets. Secrets, such as, how can I optimize my thermal paste performance inside of my PC? Okay, so previously I recommended a P-size dot or an X pattern, but those aren't necessarily the best thermal paste patterns for your specific setup. In fact, thermal paste patterns in general may not even matter at all. To really optimize cooling performance with your thermal paste, we again need to look underneath the hood of the CPU, under the IHS, the integrated heatsink. Here is where we can find the CPU dyes. And these dyes are what are actually producing the majority of heat inside of your processor, since that's where all of the electricity is being utilized. So keeping this in mind, on the surface of the IHS, you specifically want to ensure that you have thermal paste directly above these CPU dyes to ensure maximum heat transfer. So any number of thermal paste applications that can achieve this for your setup should all perform quite similarly. Kind of. Now, earlier we also mentioned that using too much thermal paste isn't something to be concerned about, which isn't entirely true if, again, we're trying to be as optimal as possible. Think of it this way, the thicker of a layer of paste that you apply inherently increases the thermal resistance since there's just more material that heat has to go through. So in a controlled setting, you would want to use just enough thermal paste to completely replace all of those microscopic air gaps between the CPU and the cooler, but no more than that for maximum efficiency. In reality though, what happens is the pressure of the CPU cooler clamping down when being installed should squeeze out the majority of thermal paste, which is typically why it's always safer to use a little more than not enough. This typically leads to the next question, should I be pre-spreading my thermal paste with a spatula or a finger cot before installing my CPU cooler? Now, 99% of the time, spreading your paste prior to installing your CPU cooler is totally fine and just another option you have in the vast world of thermal paste patterns. That said, this pattern is a bit more unique, so I want to talk about it for a little bit because it does have a few caveats to keep in mind. First of all, pre-spreading runs the risk of not filling the CPU and CPU cooler gaps to their entirety. You see, CPU IHS aren't always perfectly flat and may bow inwards causing a concave valley. In these scenarios, if you were to pre-spread your paste in a way that maintains a consistent thickness across the entire IHS, that valley could still contain an air pocket even if microscopic, which of course could lead to cool
cooling inefficiencies. On the other hand, if you just glob on some thermal paste and let the pressure from the CPU cooler when being installed do the spreading for you, it has a much better chance of flowing into this valley and circumventing this issue altogether. Now, another thing to keep in mind when pre-spreading with, say, a finger cot is that you have an increased risk of introducing outside particles into the thermal paste mix. Small dust and hair particles can further create gaps between the CPU and heatsink, but also the oils from your finger are far less thermally conductive than thermal paste itself, so you really don't want any of that near your uh, CPU. All that said, these kind of concerns are very minimal, and even if you were to pre-spread your thermal paste with even like a dusty, oily, old bare finger, your computer will still likely run totally fine. But, you know, we might as well remove as many potential issues as we can. But okay, regardless of how your thermal paste was applied, how do you actually know when to replace it inside of your PC? Earlier we said a good rule of thumb is every couple of years, which is solid, but I've personally seen computers function totally normally over a decade without ever changing the thermal paste. The true secret here is, as long as your CPU is not overheating, your thermal paste is still doing its job. And the best way to determine if you need to reapply it is simply to consistently measure your CPU temperatures so you have a sense of how it changes over time. I personally like to use MSI Afterburner as a free hardware monitor, but there are plenty of other tools that you can pick from. With it, what you want to do is see how your CPU acts in its most extreme state for how you use it. So say for example that you use your PC for gaming, you should measure your CPU temperature and clock speed during a gaming session. Now, a lot of factors can come into play here, but if you notice your CPU temperatures are increasing when playing the same type of game over the course of many months or even years, that could be an indicator that it's time for a thermal paste upgrade. Alternatively, if your CPU is throttling at clock speed, that's also an indicator that it's not staying cool enough, and you can start by first reapplying your thermal paste, and if that doesn't work, at that point you may want to consider a CPU cooler upgrade as well. But ultimately, if you've never noticed these issues and have been using your PC for 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 years, then there's really nothing to worry about. Your thermal paste is still kicking strong, and you shouldn't worry about replacing it. But finally, if you do find yourself needing to reapply thermal paste in a pinch but don't have access to normal thermal paste, what are some thermal paste alternatives that you can use around the house? Hmm, well, perhaps a topic for a future video.